Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Elias Talks Money Vlog, where I talk all things money. Today, I'm going to be talking about inflation, as well as some of the recent developments over the past month. I made a shorter video on this topic just over a month ago, and I'm going to highlight and update some of the main points from that video first. Starting off, I said that we have not experienced that much inflation thus far since the start of the pandemic and the government stimulus began. In the U.S., inflation rates have been historically between 1.5% and 2% over the past 10 years. And in April and May, we hit extremely low rates of 0.3% and 0.1%, respectively, before rebounding in June to 0.6%, still relatively low relative to the long-term rate. It's important to note, though, that we've seen inflation depending on what you're looking at. It's important to get into the details. When it comes to food, it really took off in April, May, and June, and has hit levels not seen since 2012. And it should be noted that this pickup in inflation this time around has been much more steep. Food inflation is running at around 4.5%. Medical services, meanwhile, are up 6%, and shelter costs are up 2.4%. Meanwhile, things such as gasoline are actually down 23 and a half percent and you've got apparel down seven percent if more people are working from home and staying inside the need for gasoline and clothing will obviously decrease i went on to state that this bifurcation supports the idea of the price elasticity of demand and that goods that are more necessity should have their prices hold up better like the common saying goes the basic needs are food shelter and clothing in that order and clearly we've seen this being reflected in the inflation statistics and if we look at consumer spending, which, uh, which reflects discretionary expenditures, we can see that this has fallen roughly 10% since the end of the first quarter. I went, went on to talk about the trillions in money printing that the U.S. government and other governments are doing and indicated that this posed a risk factor when we have a solution to the pandemic, we have overstimulated the economy and we have all this cash swashing around in the system and we could be setting ourselves up for a Zimbabwe-style situation. But at the same time, I noted that for the USA specifically, the odds of them having this sort of scenario are relatively less because they are the reserve currency of the world. I went on to state that the US dollar could rise relative to, especially to third world nations and that many of these nations see the United States dollar as a safe haven. But there, but there was a, a risk to the US dollar relative to gold, silver, and cryptocurrencies whose supplies are not growing at the same rate. So what have we seen over the past month and I made my initial video? Investors have been clearly looking for safety since then. Gold prices have soared from the mid-1700s to now just underneath the $2,000 level. And the majority of this pump has come in the second half of the month and we have surpassed the all-time high prices set in 2012 and 2013. An increase of 11.6%. The increase in gold prices is clearly nothing to do with jewelry. In fact, the demand for gold for jewelry is down 46% in the first half of the year and it's clearly been a desire to put money into assets that can act as a store of value. Evidence of this can uh, also be seen in silver. Um, which rose from around the $18 per ounce level to over 24 this past month, an even bigger increase of 35%. Silver so being much, uh, a much smaller market than gold is inherently uh, much more volatile, so that can be expected. And then thirdly, you have Bitcoin, which has taken off over 26%, from the low $9,000 level to over 11300 And like the other two, it took off in the second half of the month. Additionally, one thing that has been especially bullish in the cryptocurrency market is that federal regulators in the, in the U.S. have passed legislation this past month allowing major banks to custody cryptocurrency. Currently buying crypto uh, from online brokers can be a little sketchy and you have to do your research. So this can bring a whole level of confidence as well as entrance and investors into the market. And in general, the rise of these alternative assets applies to other things, other assets like platinum, palladium, and even other cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum and XRP. The Chinese government has become so concerned uh, about that that on July 29th, their regulators announced they'd be taking measures to cool the gold rush, not only towards gold, uh, which is already restricted in that country, but to other alternatives like silver, platinum, and palladium. At the same time, um, we've seen that the US dollar, the world's reserve currency, not really rise relative to other fiat currencies overall. If we look at less developed economies like Jamaica and Congo, for example, yes, it has. Uh, it has gained strength. But if you want to compare it to other world powers like China, Russia, um, the European Union, or other emerging powers like India or Brazil, the U.S. dollar has not done much at all over the past month. It's either got slightly stronger or um, a bit weaker. Part of this is the U.S. dollar may have lost some of its luster as a safe haven, which is my feeling uh, that I've as I've witnessed things. Russia and China 
now settle 50% of their uh, transactions using the US dollar. Just over four years ago, this number was over 90%. Part of this has been the consequence of the trade war, but also the fact that countries have been looking to break out from the global financial order or system uh, led by Western nations. In 2014, before the trade war, China created an alternative um, uh, to SWIFT called CIPS, China International Payment Systems. And Russia has and continues to develop similar systems while some of their banks have also adopted using CIPS. That being said, I would think it would be an exaggeration to say the dollar is dead and is no longer a safe haven fiat currency. I just believe it's fair to say that its power in this sense has come down over the past five years. So if you're going to try and look ahead uh, and use these stores of value to protect against inflation, what are some of the forward indicators that you should be looking at? Two that I would say are open interest and volume of options. This is not to say that you need to trade the options, but it will give you an idea how the institutional traders and smart money are positioning themselves. Open interest is the number of open contracts. So I do mostly option selling versus buying options. When I sell or write an option, I'm increasing the open interest by one for each contract that I write. If someone buys that option that I create and then sells the same option contract to someone else, um, the open interest would stay the same. That would just be moving the trading volume for that particular day. When you see a high open interest, that means there's a lot of contracts that have been written for that particular contract. And the amount of open interest is increasing on a daily basis. That is a positive sign. So now let's look at the GLD ETF, currently trading around the $185 level. This is for the October 16th options. You've got put options on the left, and you've got call options on the right. If you've been monitoring it regularly, you've noticed both volume and open interest for calls is rising much greater than the puts. And this is a bullish sign because it means that investors and speculators are making bets that the market will rise. Specifically, you've got massive of activity around the 205 level, which is about 10% above current prices. So I'm not going to get into the SLV silver ETF, but it's basically the same story. And you've got a massive amount of call option activity at around 10% above current prices, as well as 20 to 25% above current prices, also for the October option. Overall, unless something massively changes in our fight against the pandemic, it appears the desire for non-fiat currency stores of value will continue through the back half of the year. So far, we've talked about gold, silver, and a little cryptocurrency as far as places where people put their money to protect against inflation. One area that I haven't talked about much is real estate. Typically, real estate is considered an inflation hedge and rises uh, roughly twice the rate of inflation in North America. But there are obviously differences between jurisdictions. Currently, due, uh, due to economic factors and the nature of pandemic, obviously, we're not seeing uh, much of this right now, as the use for homes is still more of a place to live rather than speculation. The National Association for Realtors has seen a strong rebound in sales in June, particularly in the northeastern United States, following lockdowns there. Their projection for housing price increases is currently 4% for 2020, and they expect moderation in 2021 to about 3%. But you can't really take this to the bank. There's still a lot of uncertainty out there, in my opinion. Ultimately, real estate prices are driven by economic activity any way you slice it, and there is usually a lag effect. Referring to this graph from the uh, Real Estate Intelligence Network, the drivers for housing prices um, are as follows, and it really starts with GDP growth. So you have an inflow of capital that creates employment. Then you get population growth, and then that in turn increases rental demand and decreased vacancies, which then push up rents. Increased rent then pushes up the demand for properties to purchase, hence pushing up property prices. From the research that Rain has done, this cycle usually takes 12 to 18 months. Now, the thing is, we're dealing with declining uh, GDP. So the entire formula has been turned completely on its head. The U.S. economy shrank 9.5% in the second quarter. Therefore, reversing this formula with no GDP or negative GDP growth, you would have growing unemployment. That would lead to less population growth. And we've got restrictions uh, around that anyway. And this will lead to decreased rental demand, which in turn leads to more vacancies and hence decreased rents. This will result in an oversupply of property and then decreased property prices. Again, under more nor normal circumstances, this would transpire over 12 to 18 months, according to Rain's research. But the situation is anything but normal. And I believe there is potential to hit the market much sooner. Just speaking from my own experience around where I live in Toronto, Canada, where we're starting to see some bifurcation in the market, where single family and townhomes in affordable regions outside the city core are performing quite well. Then you have condos in the city core and some uh, higher value uh, homes, and they're not doing so hot right now. Real estate data is always a bit lagged as well, and what sells in June usually closes a few months down the road. So I want to monitor it closely over the next few months just to see what happens. When you hear news from Real Estate Association putting out some um, some nice projections, that 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 could be uh, true, but it could be also untrue. Take it with a grain of salt. They could be 
uh, you know, they have a, a, a best interest not to destroy market confidence because they want to keep the real estate market performing well as long as possible, uh, you know, for their brokers and realtors that they represent. They don't want to mess with what butters their bread uh, for their members and high activity in real estate as well as rising prices are important for them. So it's important to think independently on uh, what's going on and to connect the dots based on common sense and a balanced perspective. So for some final and concluding thoughts, while central banks have been printing money aggressively, there has been a flight to precious metals and even cryptos as safe stores of value. Option activity is definitely bullish and on the surface we seem poised for a record run the second half of the year. Obviously a change in the news cycle or something faster coming out as far as treatments or a vaccine can impact this if government stimulus can end sooner than expected. But government dependency, and this is just a personal opinion, can be like a drug. Once a nation gets addicted to it, uh, especially to this large extent, it can be hard to go backwards. Though we haven't seen much inflation outside of necessities right now, stores of value usually run up in anticipation, and trading in large part is run by computer models and algorithms which factor in leading economic indicators. Obviously, none of us have a crystal ball here, but I would be very surprised to see these stores of value go down much in the short term. Meanwhile, with real estate, it's a little bit different because of economic conditions. Given there's usually a delayed impact also between economic shocks and housing price declines, I believe we're in for a bit of pain. But once we start getting fully back to work and we have a vaccine or a cure, I would expect real estate uh, prices in the market in general to start to rebound afterwards and for prices to inflate along with other goods like uh, consumer discretionaries which are facing deflation right now. By that point I would expect the price of these uh, safe havens like gold, silver and Bitcoin to come off or not to be appreciating as quickly as investors would be start starting to sell these and begin to reshift their money back into investment segments like uh, real estate which are less in favor right now. That's my opinion on how things could go down. Um, that's all for today. If you enjoyed my video, please uh, like my video and also subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification button. As always, keep your feet on the ground, your head in the sky, over and out.